Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Charlie. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, I want to thank the uh, committee, Andrew, and... and uh, Everybody else for inviting me to humiliate, my, humiliate myself at a public level, which is always good. Um, I'm supposed to talk about steps six and seven, which I certainly have a lot of ex- experience. Uh, strength and hope may be another matter. Um, I, it's like, my whole life is like the like the defective character harvest uh, <laughs> once a year we just go out into the field and drag them all out for everyone to take a look at and see if they want to buy and um, <laughs> this is so al um, <laughs> uh, AA men don't cry all right <laughs> um, we just go out and destroy another relationship, but um, uh, but that's another defect of character. Anyway, I, everything sort of links together. Um, I, I sat down and read this day after this afternoon just to kind of be sure I was on the right track, and um, I there the, you can't do six, six and seven unless you've done one through five. I mean, unless you've done one through five, you can might as well just go over on the carousel right now because this is going to seem so dumb to you but uh, because you don't have any defects of character yet. Uh, we, we who have them would like you to live with that delusion for as long as possible because when you have to get rid of it, you'll be just as crotchety and gray and irritable as I am. But I, um, I believe that when I when I got here, I had. This is so hard to talk about. This it's sort of like taking something out of context and and blurting it out there. I'd much rather talk about Larry's topic, but <laughs> now that I thought now I said I said it was okay to do this, but um, so human beings, as far as I can tell, and I don't like them very much, but I've studied them a lot, <laughs> have. And, and I'm speaking to you. I, I'm a, let me quali- let me overqualify for a moment. Um, I come to you as a, uh, a an English major, which is deadly in AA, especially when you get into that big book. Uh, and um, but I I also write cartoons, so that helps in AA meetings. But um, it's a belief when, when you when you look at characters, which I deal with in my day-to-day job, that human beings like you and me are, and, and alcoholics, I believe, are not different from any other, group, any other human being on earth. We're all just humans having this human experience. We've all been given, as our book says, the instincts that God put into us. I don't think God put, I couldn't believe in a God who gives us instincts, and then when we use them, punishes us to hell. That, to me, is a dirty damn trick, if it is. And if that's your God, you can leave the room right now. But I, um, um, <laughs> but, uh, we all have ins- I mean, I, the, you know, we talk about the seven deadly sins, okay? There's lust, pride, anger, envy, sloth. Je- no, not jealousy. That's it. Gluttony and uh, and uh, greed. greed, avarice. Yes, of course, of course. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I believe that the human character, and, and this is all about character. Steps six and seven are about creating character for ourselves that we can live with, that, that, that who we really are. That we are more or less defined by our ability to yield to those instincts or resist them. We become what we are based on our uh, adoption of some of those instincts or our rejection of them. Now, virtue is for people who have 
those basic instincts who, who are those instincts are operative in them and yet they have learned through a course of behavior and or surrender to step away from them if you don't have for instance i don't gamble i don't have any interest in gambling for me to say that i ha i don't have the vice of gambling is ridiculous because I just, I've never had that, so I don't have any virtue when it comes to gambling. It's not an act of virtue for me to walk to a casino and not pay any attention to what's going on around me. It's not an act of virtue for a non-alcoholic to walk through the liquor section of a, of a grocery store and not pay any attention to the fact that they're in the wrong aisle and wanted to get bread. For an alcoholic, when I accidentally get into the liquor section of the grocery store, it's like, memories, you know, I don't, and, and that's even, that's even resist, just going, oh, no, I don't want to go down this aisle, because I do that, I don't, I don't labor, or I don't hang around where, where my own defects of character are, are tickled. We love to have our defects, it, you know, especially alcoholic men. Just lay me on my back and pat my belly, and I'll kick my leg. You know, when it comes, that's what my defects of character do for me. I just get, I get a little bit of a of the of the greed thing going, and oh yeah, yeah, okay, I, I like that. But um, but I have I have uh, you know, resisting those things is not easy. When I came in here, I was a catalog. Some people only have one or two of those things. Some people have more. For some of you, it's like a list of things to do today. Um, for me, it was just a few, but I still had real problems with anger, <laughs> um, envy, pride, and lust. So four out of seven, I think Johns Hopkins did a little uh, checklist that you are definitely... Uh, a defective character if you have four out of seven and um, <laughs> but you're not necessarily an alcoholic that's the thing is we we come into AA and we think that we have these these things that that everybody you know we're completely unique from everyone in the world we are we are alcoholic we have alcoholic emotions we have alcoholic defects of character uh, we don't have anything different from them other than the fact that what relieves my defects of character is alcohol plainly I don't worry about because what happened at first was I, I became ennobled by alcohol. Alcohol filled up all my gaps and made those defects, and I wasn't conscious of them at the time, even until someone brought it to my attention when I was sober. But, um, which, you know, I still got to work on that one. But I, uh, <laughs> I had these defects that that I didn't know I had, and when when I would get uncomfortable and I would get alienated from my fellows, which was a daily occurrence. I don't like human beings. I'll talk about that later. But um, <laughs> but I would get alienated from my fellows rather easily. The, their existence alienated me quite a bit. But when all that would happen, and I would start to feel guilty because inside, and I think Cindy touched on this, and so did Melissa this morning, that when I'm separated from other people, I am on a spiritual, I'm, I'm spiritually alone. Because other people reflect God's action and work to me, and I, yet I don't look for it when I'm going when I'm on one of my benders, my uh, emotional benders or my character defect benders. So when I had when I came in here, I was angry, envious, uh, uh, lustful, and all those things that made me when I when I participated in those defects of character, when I put them into action, I felt terrible. I felt isolated and I felt shameful and I felt alone I felt like no one else understood that and I came into AA and people I wanted to know when I was going to feel better you know when I was a newcomer I wanted to know when this is all going to change and people would just say well just come to the meeting tomorrow night and we'll tell you and I would come to the meeting the next night and no one would tell me you know and then I'd ask my sponsor and he'd say well we'll talk about that later just I'll see you tomorrow night and call me in the morning you know that got a little tired because I was having difficulties right here on planet Earth. and um, But I put it off and put it off, and I went and, and uh, uh, came to the meetings. And I started to see people differently, and I started to see that, that um, something was happening. I realized that I, I – and, and step six and seven, step seven actually is directly linked to the first step in that I have to admit something. I have to admit that I'm powerless over alcohol, and I have to admit that my life is unmanageable or has become unmanageable. Uh, that's a nice way of putting it. 
uh, is is so harsh. Uh, has become is nice. Uh, <laughs> not he is a jerk. He's become a jerk. And um, so I. Uh, doesn't that sound much better, really? Um, I should run for governor. No, I. I um, <laughs> So I started taking the steps. I took the first step against my better judgment and against my willpower. I, I couldn't take it willfully until finally my sponsor said, you either are or you aren't. Are you powerless over alcohol? I said, I don't know. Did you drink? Yes. Did you? Were you able to just stop drinking when you wanted to? No, not at all. Okay. Can you admit that you were powerless over it when you started drinking it? Okay. I, is your life unmanageable? Duh. Uh, look at me, you know, and uh, and I, I wasn't quite as buffed out as I am today, but I, um, I uh, then I took the second step because I kept coming to meetings. As I came to the meetings, I came to believe that if a power, if there's some power in the room that's working for you, that perhaps it will work for me if I stick around, but I wasn't convinced, really. And it took me a while to get the second step down. And then the third step was to surrender to that power, you know, turn my life over to that power. And I thought, oh, God, well, I'll turn it over to my sponsor. Because Bill said, you just call me in the morning and you tell me what's worrying you. And then you let me worry about it for the rest of the day. And you just go to work and do your business. And I'll worry about your problem. and I'll come up with a solution for you. Is that a deal? And I said, yeah. Now, I'm not a stupid guy. That really sounded like, you know, the, the tooth fairy to me. But uh, <laughs> but I said, okay, I'll let you – you worry about my problems. And the thing was that I trusted this man because I'd heard his story. And I'd heard what a, what a misbegotten loser he was and how he destroyed his life <laughs> and how alcohol – always made him feel like there was a moment of hope left that he would finally get it in order and be able to drink successfully like a gentleman. And that's exactly how I felt. And maybe this time it'll be a little bit different. Maybe this time when I try to manipulate myself into a woman's favor, it'll be true. When I know, and and I have a couple of ex-wives who know that um, <laughs> that I'm a selfish, self-centered, and fearful human being. And when that fear overtakes me, I will say anything to get away from that fear. And when I drink, that mitigates everything. It lifts my spirit up and makes me feel whole. It makes me actually believe the stuff that I'm putting out there. You know, it made alcohol made me a better person. It made me the made me feel like the person I was supposed to be. When I'm not drinking, I'm just a complete brittle, irritable. A loser, but when I drink, I have hope that things are going to get better. It just fills me up. It swells up every pore in me. It makes me feel alive and noble and full of character and full of determination. And I'm not a procrastinator anymore. I'm a get to it guy when I'm drinking. I, when I drink, I can see the big picture. I can make it happen. Um, but not today. I'll do it later. But I. Um, <laughs> And that's a defect of character because pro <laughs> procrastination is another one of my defects of character. Um, and, and this is not a joke, so don't laugh when I tell you this. But uh, I bought about 20 years ago. I was sober. I bought a book on procrastination called Procrastination. I only read about a chapter of it before I decided I would read more later. <laughs> Someone asked me, someone said they were a chronic procrastinator. They saw the book, and I said, well, why don't you borrow it and read it? I don't think they only sold but one copy of that book <laughs> because every procrastinator I know got it, read a chapter, and somebody else said, I'm a procrastinator. Can I borrow that? And they just passed it around. That book has gone to every procrastinator in Southern California. But um, I do that. And then I grind on it. I grind on the unfulfilled stuff that I should have done. And, and then here's the procrastinator's dream is I grind on it, I drink on it, I drink over it, I drink to it. I convince myself that the drinking is actually in preparation for the action of doing something. <laughs> and then, then I don't do it and I drink again to get the satisfaction of a job well done without having to do a damn thing. <laughs> Tell me that's not a weird defect of character. 
<laughs> that's something alcoholics understand because people keep saying, stop drinking and go to work, do what you've got to do. They don't understand. They don't get it. You get it. I'm staying with you, you know, because my, my drinking friends all got it. And so these defects of character were all things that, and I would sneer at the people who were successful, the thing that I wanted to be in. You know, I couldn't do it, but the people who could do it were saps. They were, they were lesser, they had lesser talent, less talent than I did. It's just that other people were giving them breaks that I couldn't get. So I could hate them with impunity. And then I would drink to feel ennobled and superior to them. You know, these are all, and the greatest crime, I think, of a defect of character and to follow through, follow through like alcoholics do in that cycle of drinking to relieve the guilt, the shame, the embarrassment, the frustration, the anger, the end, all those things. We drink to do that, which furthers the cycle of putting things off, furthers the cycle of continuing to take bad actions that we take over and over and over again related to those one of those seven deadly sins, as we call them. And and eventually I am uh, bankrupt inside, completely morally, spiritually bankrupt, but I can't stop drinking. That's desperation. That's despair. That's what's been described here. I've heard Larry talk before. Larry and I have been friends for a long time. He talks about despair. We don't get here on a hope that maybe maybe this will make it better. It's not that kind of an attitude at all. Uh, it's more like, I can't believe I'm doing this. I can't believe I'm calling Alcoholics Anonymous. I can't believe I'm going to an AA meeting. <clears throat> Those people are the, they're awful. I wish them well, but <laughs> but they clearly have a problem I don't have. I can take one look at them and see that's the case. But then I started doing the steps, and I got to step four and did an inventory. And oh, my God, I didn't see it right away, but it's like one of those inventories to a, a person doing one. I get it out on paper, and then it's like one of those magic eye pictures that you stare at for a while, and all of a sudden you see another picture inside of it. That's what an inventory was for me. I read it to my sponsor, and about two-thirds of the way through reading it, I thought, I'm doomed. Oh, my God. Who is this person? This is a... This is hellish. This is, and it wasn't even that bad. I, I wasn't one of those people that, you know, uh, did grandiose, horrible things. I just did those little, pathetic things that, that separate me further from being part of the world and part of you and, in turn, part of whatever my creator has in store for me, which is, again, what I think is the worst crime of a defective character is that it keeps people like you and me from ever making an attempt to do that which God, I believe, has destined for every single one of us. We do something really well, exceedingly well, whether it's parenting or, or gardening or whatever it is you do. If you can do it with love, that's what was meant for you to do. And, and we move through our lives, and we're, we're open to surprises, too. When we, just when you think you found something you really love, somehow there's a shift in the road, and I wind up doing something else that I thought I was afraid of and doing it anyway. But I got that, that inventory done, and my sponsor went through, and I, uh, we, I picked out my defects of character, and they were pretty clear. And, and uh, for the next, I would say, six years, the first six years of my sobriety, I didn't do step six. I did step six or seven in a perfunctory way. You know, it's, it's only two paragraphs in the big book. How easy is that? I mean, I, I dove right on that one paragraph. Okay, I got defects of character. Yeah, take them. Next, you know, let's go. <laughs> But I, I always I, I mentioned one time mistakenly to Bill that steps six and step seven were just uh, filler for the program, so that we didn't have like the Ten Commandments, you know. Uh, so we had we had to take those defects of character and trot them out there like they like God's really going to take those things away. And I just didn't believe God really took them away. And, and my sponsor was intrigued by this information that I'd given him. And um, he said, can you elaborate on that a little? And I said, yeah. Um, I am such a tard when it comes to that. But I, uh, but I, I elaborated. I said, I, I have been saying the six and seven step prayer. 
You know, I say this, the, the prayer in the morning. I get up, I get on my knees, I say that prayer, just like Melissa talked about this morning. And, and then I go to bed at night and I say it again. I still have the same, I still get as angry with people and as frustrated and as full of just wanted to have a missile launcher on the roof of my car. Just, just, and I, I would, I would fantasize sometimes in, in, in quieter moments about what it would be like if I could have God's power for about 10 minutes. And some of you would really be sweating, you know, but. All, and I said, so the, the step doesn't work because I still, I'm six, I, at the time I was six years or so sober, and I'm still in traffic, some, you know, I'm spiritual, I just left my house, I just got a shower, I'm going to a job, surprise, surprise, I'm uh, enjoying myself, I'm, I've got friends, I'm spiritual, I'm a spiritual being, until I get to the Ventura Freeway, <laughs> then every piece of vermin on earth seems to crawl out of the ground and be focused on, let's get him. Let's get the little white boy. Let's make him sweat, you know? And, um, hey, dork, how do you like this? You know? And I, my, the hair goes up on the back of my neck at the, at the complete exercising of defects of character by others. And I want to be humble, but I don't want to be humble by myself. <laughs> so, I, so I'm not going to do that. So I just get right back into it, you know, and you just get that head of steam going. And, and then I get to work, and I'm frustrated and irritated, and I, you know, uh, but I want to be spiritual. <laughs> And then, I, and then I have a counter problem, and I've, I've told this story a hundred times. I, I remember one day I was having a particularly bad day. I was late for work. I was late getting out of the house. My fault, my fault, my fault. And I get to work, and I'm, I'm running late, and I, there's a little coffee area in the lobby of the building where I work. And I go up to the coffee area, and there's, there's a line of people, you know, already. I'm thinking, why do they all need muffins now when I need them? <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, great. Oh great, I'm late and now they're all in line and I'm I'm standing there and I'm I'm just just sweaty palms just getting you know holding it together holding it together and then and there's a menu there's about eight items on this menu and the, and it was probably a five or a six minute wait in line and we're getting closer and closer then the lady in front of me who's been standing in line gets up to the front of the line and the guy says what would you like? And she goes, oh, I don't know. <laughs> what do you mean you don't know? For God's sake, the thing's been up there for six freaking minutes. You've been standing here, and I'm late for work, and you don't know. And then she's going, I had a muffin here the other day that was so good, I just can't remember what it was. And, and she's looking at this thing of muffins, and she's saying, the guy goes, blueberry? And she goes, M maybe. No, it wasn't blueberry. <laughs> How about apple cinnamon? No, I don't know if it was apple cinnamon. I thought, here, here, here's a muffin in the bag. Take it. I'll buy it for you. Just eat the goddamn muffin and stop. <laughs> you know what? You're not, you're not picking a college for your kid, okay? It's a muffin. It's a muffin. How? Say you make, say you make the entirely wrong choice. How long do you have to live with that? Just get your muffin, your coffee, pack up your bindle, and get your pathetic soul out of my way. I need to get what I need. She turned around in line and said, Oh my gosh, I didn't realize there were people behind me. I'm so sorry. And I said, that's okay. <laughs> that is why I drink. <laughs> right then. But getting back to my conversation with my sponsor, it was those moments that were making me believe to my innermost self that step six and seven don't work. And Bill listened to that, and I told him about people cutting off in traffic and that kind of stuff, and it just makes me crazy because there's a lack of consideration. It's an insult. Da, 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 da. And he said, well, and you do the prayer in the morning? And I said, yes. And he said, and you do it at night before you go to bed? And I said, yes. And he goes, I'll tell you what, when you're driving in traffic and somebody does that the next time, why don't you say the prayer then? <laughs> oh, 
I hate that. I hate that. <laughs> but you know what? The next time I'm going up the 405, which is if any of you are from Southern California or have been there, the 405 is like the third concentric ring of hell <laughs> and, uh, in Dante's Inferno. And I'm driving the 405, and there was a guy who was literally purposely cutting people off and slamming his brakes on. He was insane, and he was laughing and doing this. He was cutting people off, and then he'd slam his brakes on, and then he'd take off, and he'd whip through traffic. With no it was, He was a mad person, and I am Captain Justice. <laughs> you can't tell just by looking at me. <laughs> But that's some bitch has got to pay. <laughs> there are times in life where someone with courage has to step forward. <laughs> but instead, I heard Bill McDonald in the back of my head saying, why don't you say the prayer when it's happening? And I said... I offer myself to you to build with me, you know, my creator. I'm now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. And I said that prayer, I swear, 20 times while I was going over that, over the pass in the freeway. And the more I said it, the less my grip was tight on the wheel, the, and the more I could relax my fingers, and the more I could take a deep breath, and it just went away. Because what I was doing was focusing on trying to take God's, decisions and surrender that to him in a way that I didn't even believe it when I started doing it. I just thought, okay, I'll prove him wrong. And I started doing it. And I kept saying it over and over and over and over again. And it lifted. And the defect of character went away for that moment. The defects of character, unfortunately, there's a catch, it seems to me, in the state, in the, in the uh, prayer that says, I'm not willing that you should have all of me, uh, I ask that you remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. I don't like that little loophole. That means that occasionally God may want to use me as a bad example. <laughs> that will somehow serve his purpose in some, in some selfish God-like way. <laughs> to be content with retaining the defect of character and trying to surrender it a day at a time until it's his choice to let me. And, and you know what the funny thing is? And I've been around a little time. I've been around 24 years and, and uh, I've been sober 24 years. I've been around 24. I have been around exactly 24 and a half years. I've been sober 24 and a half years. But um, the defects of character don't go away. They don't just evaporate. But I learn, as the, as the promises say, that you learn to deal with situations that used to baffle you. And Cindy talked about that. There, there's a point where, you know, I, I don't know how to handle this. I guess I'm going to have to keep saying that prayer over and over again in my stupid zombie-like fashion before I can actually surrender it and, and try to see something better. Uh, one time I was angry at people. At a, I, I'm angry often, uh, at, not so much anymore, but, but that back then. Now I sponsor guys who are angry, which is a, is a, a penance all its own. But I... Um, <laughs> I was really, I was ready to leave my group, and uh, I didn't want to stay there anymore. I knew, because once you've been around a group, when you get into a new group, it, every, and Larry will talk about this, but uh, when you're in a new group, everybody's wonderful. You know, you go to a new meeting, and everybody there is really great, and this is the way they ought to be working the program. My group is full of Peyton Place little interconnections, and people getting knocked up and cheating on their husbands, and then, but here, everyone's pure and chaste. <laughs> Because I don't know their stories yet, you know. <laughs> and I was ready to leave my group because everybody there was just under my skin in some way or another. And I saw hypocrisy and I saw foolishness and I saw people, you know, I got my self-righteous uh, freak on, you know. Um, which is another one of those defects of character that our book talks about. is Self-righteousness kills people like you and me because eventually the self-righteousness separates me from everybody else and I either have to do something to stop being that way or I will surely drink again. And I don't suffer any delusions about my, my, uh, my, the possibility that I could drink again, that I've never entertained any thought that I'm cured or close to it. I will drink again if I don't do something uh, immediately with these steps. And so... Uh, I was telling Bill this, and he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you tonight, when you when they say the Lord's Prayer, 
I want you to get a seat in the middle of the meeting for the meeting. And when you're saying the Lord's Prayer, don't look down at your feet because that's not where God is. And don't look up at the sky because he's not in the ceiling panels either. I want you to look at everybody standing around you. Just let your eyes glance side to side in the meeting and take a look at the people around you and start picking out the people you really like and really care about. And I said, well, then what? And he goes, just do it and see what happens. So I did exactly what he said. I went to the, sat in the middle of the meeting, held hands for the Lord's Prayer, which I appreciate your bowling over the guy trying to say the serenity prayer this morning. Thank you for um, bulldog that kind of behavior around here. But, uh, and, and, th and, <laughs> and thank you for not substituting strength for bread either. That's wrong. It's wrong. Anyway, um, um, But he, I looked around at the people in the meeting, and I started looking at the people I liked. And I thought, there's Dave, and there's Steve, and there, I, I'm going through this whole, I'm looking at everybody in front of me, and it's like, again, like the magic eye picture, which is what this whole program does. It allows us to ignore all the cacophony of things in front of us and see the stuff that's really in there coming to the surface in stark relief against all the other confusion. And what I could see was that there were dozens of people in that meeting who I was completely interconnected with. My sobriety, in fact, I owe my sobriety to a lot of those people. You know, and I'm looking at them and I thought, point, well, I get it now. I get it. I see the people I care about. I don't want to leave the group anymore. These are the people that really help me. And the other people, I'm going to have to deal with them and be kind. And I didn't think that at the moment, but I thought, I'll just put them on my list. And uh, and when when revenge comes, I'll just uh, sit back and say, hey, I didn't do it. But um, <laughs> but what happens in in the you know we talk about normal people, um, which is kind of funny. It always makes me laugh to hear people talk about normies as if there is any such thing. Uh, you can listen to Dr. Laura for three days in a row, and that will, that will dispel any notion that there is normalcy in the world. <laughs> the thing that makes us distinct from non-alcoholics, as I like to call them, is that when, when I run into a wall where my insides are churned up with fear and anger and sadness and despair and, and uh, uh, envy and all of those things I talked about, I drink. And even though I know, I know from all the facts in front of me that alcohol will eventually take me down, I continue to drink with that insidious belief that someday it's going to get better. That's what alcoholism is to me and is to everybody in this room. You know, we all know we're here having a good time this weekend because we believe in the power of each other acting out the power of something that's greater than all of us. And, and those defects of character stay in check when we see other people and we start to care about them. Because what I had to do for a long time was walk out of, the, walk out of a meeting and get out on the street and look at people out there and try to, you know, how, you ever do this? You try to attach a face of one of them to someone that you know in a meeting. There's sort of a, a certain type that you know from AA, especially if they're being difficult with you or, or I'm starting to get my hackles up. I look at them and go, oh, that's a... That guy looks just like so-and-so, and I can like that guy because he reminds me of somebody I care about. I had to play those games all the time to surrender that anger, just to surrender it to somebody else. <laughs> and um, I remember one time I, I have the, the um, self-righteousness, as I said. I got a whole catalog. We'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, when I, was, I taught high school for a while. And I remember one day, I taught at a Catholic high school, <laughs> sleep tight, parents, but I, uh, um, <laughs> so I uh, was in my, in my room grading papers at lunchtime, and there was a rule at our school that you uh, could not be in the hallway um, during lunch hour or during, re during break because uh, they didn't want kids in the hallway. And I'm sitting in there grading papers, and I hear chattering out in the hall. In the, uh, in the hallway where I am. So I go out there and lean out the door, and there's a young man standing there with about four girls, and he's talking to them, you know, and it's, he's doing his young guy thing. And I'm looking at him, and I said, excuse me, there aren't supposed to be any students in the hallway. And he wasn't one of my kids, and neither were the, none of the girls were in my classes. I said, this is a, a, a lunch break, and you're not supposed to be in the hallway. 
And he looks at me and he smiles and he goes back to talking to the girls again. And I said, I'm sorry, can you take your conversation downstairs? And he stopped for a second and he looked over at me as only a 17 year old boy can do. You know, the look. The girls do this. You know. <laughs> Guys, guys have this one. This is the guy. You can't do it face on. You have to turn a little bit. You have to go like this. That. Which means in a second, pops. Now fear's crept in because he hasn't listened to what I'm saying. He hasn't responded to my self-righteous order to get out of the hallway. And I've been polite, right? And I said, excuse me, but your little tough guy attitude with your four little friends here might work in the playground, but it doesn't work with a real human being grown up. So why don't you pack up your bindle and get your sorry butt downstairs like you're supposed to be with the other people? And I slammed the door and went to my desk and thought, yes, yeah, yeah, mess with me, yeah. Um, 30 seconds later, I felt terrible. I felt sick inside because what had happened was one of the cardinal rules I learned in my group and learned through uh, taking inventories and watching other alcoholics, and that is I do not treat people who have no power to retaliate with disrespect. I don't treat people with disrespect anyway. That's one thing I try not to do. But I didn't respect this kid, and there was nothing he could do about it. And it was an unfair assertion of authority over somebody who didn't have any way to fight back. It would be like yelling at a waitress. She can't yell back because she'll lose her job. So I've got an unfair advantage, and I'm using it, and that's cruel. And it's all based on my not getting something I want, as the book talks about in steps six and seven. I'm either not getting something I want, or I've got something I can't get rid of, and I'm frustrated about it, or I haven't done something that I should be doing. And uh, I realized that's what I did with that kid. So I went outside immediately, and they were gone. And I look out the window down on the courtyard, and there's, you know, a thousand kids down there all talking. I couldn't see the guy, and I thought, oh, man. So the next day, I'm back in my room grading papers at lunchtime, and I hear this at the door, and I look up, and there's a little window in the door, and it's that kid. And he came in. I, I kind of I, I kind of wondered, if, is the door locked? You know, um, <laughs> um, the first reaction. The second reaction was, you know, come in. So he walks in, and he stands in front of my desk, and I thought, this isn't going to be pretty. And he said, Mr. Carney, um, I'm going to be graduating from here in three months, and I don't want there to be any bad blood between me and a teacher in here. And if I disrespected you yesterday, I'm really sorry. Stuck his hand out. I couldn't shake it because I was only that big. But I, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> that kid dealt with a defect of his character in a constructive way to show me how it's done. You know, he made amends too. He made direct amends where it was necessary, and I was floored. You know, and, that, and the, the thing that, that makes me believe that God gets into all this is because I never had that young man in any of my classes ever. I never spoke to him uh, in any course of conversation in, in the school because I didn't have a day-to-day -day, uh, uh, interaction with him. However, from that day forward, for the next three years, when he came home from college on his, on his uh, holiday breaks, he would come in and say hi. He'd come into my office and say hi and ask me how things were going, tell me how his school was going. I was touched by that, to think that this kid, who I had taken the bad action with, was man enough to walk in and be gracious about it, you know. This is shedding a defective character, you know, and I try to remember that. I try to remember all these little things that have occurred in my life since I've been sober, and I try to listen to all the things that people tell me in AA, and, um, and gradually I start to change my attitude, which is step six, is all about attitude, and step seven is taking action, and it's going and, and literally verbally surrendering that defective character and or shortcomings. We had someone ask me at lunch today, what's the difference between a defective character and a shortcoming? Uh, I have no idea. It's, uh, it's one of those torture topics at a topic meeting. <laughs> you can sit around and listen to people talk about it for an hour and a half about the, the distinction between defective character and shortcoming. <laughs> And the secondary torture topic is, what's the difference between God's will and my will? <laughs> um, so, 
to summarize. I'm never going to get better. I'm never going to get, I'll put it this way, I'll get better, but I'm not going to get well. What I have is two distinctly different approaches to dealing with these things inside of myself that separate me from other human beings, that pit me against other human beings. And I have to let them go if I want to be here and be part of life and part of this fellowship. I cannot allow those defects of character to separate me from the people who are going to save my life at some point or another. I can't afford to have enemies in sobriety because I may need one of these people or they may need me and feel like, well, I can't talk to him because he's a son of a bitch and so I'll just drink to show him, you know? And I can't make anybody get drunk, but my attitude can certainly contribute to someone making a decision that would ignite one of their defects of character and these clashing of instincts, as the book talks about, are what make all of us uncomfortable. And yet the melding of instincts the acceptance of other people because I understand that I too have these defects and I'm working on a daily basis to get rid of them allows me to accept, forgive, and be kind to other people in the program and in turn take that outside and try to live my life that way. I'm going to read one thing at the end of uh, um, it's in the 12 and 12 on page 76. And it says um, – if that degree of humility could enable us to find the grace by which such a deadly obsession could be banished, then there must be hope for the same result respecting any other problem we could possibly have. And with that, thank you. We'll turn it over to Larry. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.